way that that statement is meaningful is, again, to a mind that believes it's a person. You can see what, where would that, why would that have any meaning? Well, isn't that what you're talking about, though, when you say use the body for an expanded perception? I mean, you're still, that's still based on the assumption that there is a person, there is a body. Well, yeah, you were also saying, saying it's you're saying also to prepare the mind for something, and I'm just saying that those are all interpretations and rungs on the ladder. That, in, in the ultimate sense, those don't prepare the mind for anything. The mind just sees the falsity of all of that. There's nothing causative about behavior. So what good is the miracle? It doesn't bring the mind to see the false is false. No, I'm just saying the behavior, you were talking about the behavioral component of the miracle brings the mind and when you get to the deepest aspect of looking at what a miracle is, there isn't a behavioral component. A miracle is a, is a, it could be described another way as right-mindedness. Is there a behavior to right-mindedness? So when we talk about a behavioral component, that's one of those rungs on the ladder for the mind that believes it's a person. That can be helpful. And all I was saying is, isn't, isn't that the same wrong that you're talking about when you say that the body can be used to bring about an expanded perception? Mm -hmm. It's just important to be very clear
baked potato in the microwave or whatever the learning seems to be. The learning seems to be taking place out there in the world of form. But what we're doing is taking it way, 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 way back and seeing that that the mind is the classroom and the mind is the learner. That the body or the person never learn anything. This was a distinction that came up on the uh, when we had the intensive on the bay here, the two weeks intensive, when one of the participants kept saying, this is a classroom. My job is a classroom. My relationship is a classroom. My this is a classroom. As if the world is where all the classrooms are, in forms. As if you have, as if you're a person who's learning and you're going, you're passing through different classrooms. My job classroom, my relationship classroom, my my family classroom, you know, so on and so forth, and that's not that's not it at all. You know, it still anchors the mind as its, its belief as it's a person learning in the classrooms of the world. What we do is we pull it all the way back, way back to the to the mind, and say. The mind is the classroom, there's only two lessons, and I'm learning one lesson or the other all the time. And I need to get real clear about these lessons, because I don't want to continue this conflictual attempt of being a conflicted teacher and a conflicted learner, since the mind is teaching all the time what it is, and learning all the time, therefore, what it is. It, that's where the discernment has to come in. I need to be very, very clear about these two, two lessons. So I can lay aside one and learn the only one that I could ever learn, <laughs> which is the reflection of my reality. I still have a hard time with the idea um, when, when we're talking about one mind and that bodies don't learn. And I guess because of the reading I've done that led me to the course or while I was just being introduced to the course, other metaphysical readings and um, masters of the Far East and stuff, it seems that there are other beings that have reached enlightenment or, you know, so have come to the truth and awareness of the one reality. And yet if there's only one mind, it seems like if one achieved that, then all would have achieved it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that some part of the mind is just asleep while potentially part of it is awake. Well, we could come at that by saying that the assumption beneath that is it seems to be, you could call them beings or persons, reach enlightenment. And that would, be, that would have to be from the worldly perception that <coughs> persons reach enlightenment. It could be a stepping stone to say that one could say a Buddha or Jesus, for example, of course, says Jesus was the first to awaken from the dream. So if you took that kind of framework, that's a metaphor. You know, it's a symbol that kind of like, as a model, what he did, I can do too. But it still assumes that Jesus was a person, that he actually had a life in this world. He was a living, walking, breathing being. And you can see there's the, all of that's fraught with all kinds of assumptions that somehow that there is life in this world. That that life isn't as kind of like at the end of the movie being there where it says life is a state of mind. That's what the Course is teaching, that life is a state of mind. And yet when the mind believes in <coughs> the world and it believes that in organic life or inanimate and versus animate, it, when it, it makes all these associations as if things that grow and breathe and move are life, and as if things that don't grow and breathe and move, like a stone for example, some people may say a stone doesn't really have life. Depends if you go into some new age shops, <laughs> you might get a different versions of that too. The crystal, oh, it's got such power and energy, <laughs> this and that. But there's all kinds of variations and everything, but still, the whole assumption there is that there is some life on this world. 
when I believe in individual people, then individual enlightenment seems to make sense. It seems to be the case. But it seems to be helpful even. Yeah, it if, seems if you to be symbolic. Believe there was no hope, and there right. was no right. truth, and but there it was it is no. only symbolic because it's seen from a perspective of there are in fact individuals when there aren't in fact individuals. <laughs> You know, looking at it from the other perspective, it's like coming at it from the direction of the world, it looks that way. Coming at it from the direction of heaven or the real world or whatever you want to call it makes no sense at all. There are individuals who pass over into this other world of enlightenment one by one. <laughs> the metaphor I've used is, I have seen the paper now to hear, but the, that if we said that Everything on this side of the paper, so to speak, is the world, the cosmos, time and space. And that the paper is symbolic of the real world or true perception. In the sense that the real world or true perception just is like the bridge. And then over here would be heaven, total oneness and unity. The other side of that paper. Yeah. Right. As if this is, of course, a metaphor. because. Right. This there is all that there is. <laughs> There's no paper. This is an illusion, and this that I'm describing are both illusions. But in the metaphor, if this is the cosmos, this is the real world or true perception, that from this side, so to speak, it seems as the if... The world side. From the world side, it seems as if there's Jesus and perhaps a few other beings, we could call them enlightened beings, seem to have ascended. They kind of go, seem to go... <laughs> right there into the paper, and then that's the last we see of them. <laughs> we still hear of their ideas, and we're, even the metaphor of Jesus, you know, when Jesus says, I am in charge of the, of the plan of atonement, as if it's this big, long, linear plan that's leading back to God, it would have to still be speaking from the paper, right? There's no plan of atonement. On the other side? Yeah. Uh, in heaven, there's nothing to be atoned for. There's nothing to be forgiven. There's no time process There's millions no of years. Who have left God. They're right. There's nothing over here. So even when we have statements from the Course about I am in charge of the plan of atonement and so on and so forth, that has to be speaking from the paper. That metaphor. And it's a helpful metaphor. I remember what, I was talking with a fellow one time in, um, in uh, Kentucky who was a student and he was saying, uh, well, here's my version of the Course. He said, I'm studying the Course, I'm working hard at this, and I know that I can, if I hang with this, I will come to enlightenment. And then I'll do just like all those other, like Jesus and the other beings before me, I will ascend. And I said, well, what happens then? And he said, well, then the world will continue on and other beings will slowly come and ascend. I said, how can that be? You know, I said, if the world, if there's no world outside your mind, and you made up all the bodies and all the projections and everything, once you come to enlightenment, where are those? Where are those worlds? Where are? Where is that world? Where is everything else? And he was like, Oh, wait a minute! My gosh! Through <laughs> a was, major hitch. Like, oh. theory. Because <laughs> it was like just trying to to just yeah. take that in and look at that yeah. that whole perspective of. Oh, so it's not like after I ascend that there will be a world that will continue on with all these other beings that are a little slower <laughs> than me, a little less fervent, you know, in, in their passion to wake up, that they're still in, undergoing some the process. Some that are lost cases. Yeah, some that <laughs> yeah. seem to be lost <laughs> cases. Well, it seems it's going to be, take a long <laughs> time for them to get right. to this place. You know, that doesn't make any, any sense. Jesus says, how many teachers of God does it take to save the world? One. He says, you, he's again speaking to the deceived mind, he says, you cannot understand this and grasp this. And, or another way he says it in other places, no one in the world can understand what this means. Of course in not. The world. No one in the world <laughs> can understand what this means. Have to transcend the world. So basically, Jesus is a, is a symbol of the right mind talking to the wrong mind. Yes. yes. The Holy Spirit taking on the form of a voice that speaks in the mind is a symbol. 
of the right mind talking to the wrong mind.